Throughout history, man has sought to become the equals of God, to know what God knows, and do as God does. Science and technology is just one manifestation of man's never-ending pursuit for mastery over his environment. And for the Illuminati specifically, life extension technologies and total information awareness serve to bridge the gap between themselves and Godhood. But there is another road to Godhood, a road the Illuminati are all too familiar with, whose existence is one of their most closely guarded secrets, and that's transformation into the body of life. Utilizing both technology and magic, the Illuminati intend on completing the process of self deification Transformation into the body of light has been a ritual practice in all parts of the world for thousands of years, and still only the privileged elite even know of its existence. It goes under many names, but its most well-known alias is George Lucas's Jedi. The Jedi, or the Jedi, was a secretive order of magicians in ancient Egypt who had been transformed into new kinds of beings with magical abilities. The Uraeus, the serpent-adorned headpiece that was often seen on Egyptian pharaohs and gods, was a symbol of those who had undergone this ritual. The serpent was placed over the forehead because the forehead was the location of the third eye. The serpent was used because it symbolized those who had their kundalini, or inner serpent, raised from the base of their spine up through the chakras and placed into their foreheads. Dejed means spinal column. In this ancient rite, the initiate would be led blindfolded into the very center of the Great Pyramid at Giza, where they would lay into a sarcophagus, which is like a giant coffin. From there, while clinically dead, certain incantations are said over the coffin. Three days later, the person would be reborn as a Jedi, with abilities that we would associate with powerful magicians. Afterwards, they experience the world through the eyes and abilities of a spirit, yet still have flesh. They could create objects at will, move objects from afar, move at incredible speeds, have extrasensory perception, telepathy, the ability to see spirits, and also complete control of their astral bodies, allowing them to tear their soul away from its fleshly encasing at will and send their astral bodies to distant places in the universe. Today, this ritual of the body transformation is reenacted by the Masons and Skull and Bones. In fact, you've seen it before. When somebody is initiated into the 33rd degree of Freemasonry, they are blindfolded and lowered into a pyramid. After the initiate has taken the oath, his mask is removed and he quote unquote receives the light. But this is not just a figurative light of knowledge, but reborn in literal light. Alan Moore's film, From Hell, starring Johnny Depp, is about an investigator who smokes opium to receive visions of the future and past. Against him is a series of murders perpetrated and concealed by the Freemasons, who occupy all the significant seats of power in 19th century London. The movie, aside from a countless Masonic compasses and all-seeing eyes, depicts a reenactment of this most secretive ritual. Let the brother receive the light. At Yale University's Skull and Bones, initiates are placed in a coffin where they reveal their deepest secrets and are afterwards told that they are reborn as bonesmen. They are also told that they are now superior to Earth's human population and use war and suffering to control the planet. In movies like The Skulls, this ritual is cryptically depicted as the main character, a new initiate to The Skulls, is asked whether he is ready to be reborn, after which he is drugged and wakes up in a coffin along with other prospective Skull and Bone initiates. Hello? Are you ready to be reborn? Many terms that I believe are really just alternative names of this transformation and its recipients are the reborn, the black flame, those who have risen, the resurrected, assuming God form, self-deification, 
the Black Pilgrimage, the Oath, the Dragon Body, the Initiated, the Vampire, Warlocks, Druids, and of course, the Jedi. This conversion usually happens in large structures like pyramids and on ley lines. The Masons and the Illuminati have long used the Phoenix in their symbolism. This is because the Phoenix is a symbol of death and rebirth. In 1993's Warlock, the Armageddon, this ritual is nakedly displayed as the main character, Kenny Travis, is deliberately killed by his father so that he may be brought back to life with magical powers. I didn't ask you to shoot me. Like the phoenix rising from the ashes, the warrior rises from his own death. Two days ago, my dad shot me. Dead. And then he brought me back to life, so now I'm like this walking zombie. Then, his girlfriend and daughter of the town preacher insists on undergoing the same ritual so that she may fight at his side with similar abilities. I have to be reborn. There's only one way. I know. One book that mentions the Jedi and the many names they've had throughout the centuries is called The Return of the Serpents of Wisdom. The book's main focus is the reverence for serpents that exists in each human culture and how the gods have always been associated with the serpent. Mankind's relationship with the reptile is indeed a strange one. Humans have a natural aversion to reptiles. There are few creatures we would sooner kill in order to spare the life of a snake. Dogs, cats, bunny rabbits, dolphins, in fact humans more often than not would rather see a snake die than just about any mammal on the planet. And yet, humans have, since ancient times, venerated the serpent and associated it with wisdom, godly powers, and the gods themselves. Even Jesus said to be as wise as serpents, while every other reference of the serpent in the Bible was unanimously negative. The return of the serpents of wisdom is kinda new agey, so the wise step lightly, but the book's cover is quite revealing. You have a body made of fire, receiving energy from two all-seeing eyes inside of pyramids, hovering above with the help of what appears to be the wings of the phoenix. Inside of the transformed man, the caduceus, or twin serpents, a picture truly is worth a thousand words. But here's another picture that's worth a thousand words. It's a card from Steve Jackson's card game Illuminati, The Game of Conspiracy. The card's name is Unmasked, and the caption below reads, There is a secret of our cabal that even you of the Twelfth Circle have not known until now. Now to understand the magnitude of this card, you need a bit of context. Take a look at some of the other cards in Steve Jackson's card game. This card game, whose final goal is world domination, was created by an admitted magician named Steve Jackson. In 1990, Steve Jackson's company was raided by the Secret Service, and three years later, he would create a website hosting company called Illuminati Online. In 1995, the card game was released, and later in 1999, George Bush's presidential campaign website was hosted by Steve Jackson's Illuminati Online. The game has hundreds of cards like this, and now that you have a taste of what those other cards must look like, ask yourself why Steve Jackson has a card for every person, method, technology, an organization the Illuminati have ever used, letting it all hang out with pyramids, all-seeing eyes, and 666 everywhere. And yet, this card means seemingly nothing, and yet claims to show one of their cabal's most deepest secrets. That's because it does, my friends. So much so that even in Steve Jackson's shameless card game, he remains vague, so that only those who should know the card's meaning, do know the card's meaning. Most of us are familiar with the theme of a devilish version of oneself sitting on one shoulder while their angelic copy sitting on the other. But there's a thread of truth to this. Each person is assigned both a demon counterpart and an angelic counterpart. The demon counterpart whispers dark thoughts into the mind, encouraging it to do evil, while the angelic counterpart, or guardian angel, 
encourages you to do righteous things and protects you from things unseen. This transformation of the body involves the merger of yourself, your demonic, and your angelic counterpart into a single body. In previous documentaries like Hollywood Insider's Full Disclosure, I've accused George Lucas of not only taking characters from religions and mythology, but also of having reversed the heroes and villains. A documentary called The Illuminati, for instance, had a clip of Jordan Maxwell claiming that Freemasons actually believe in a character called Yoda and receive guidance from him. Unfortunately, and as usual, Maxwell failed to report where he got this information. He also claimed that the quote-unquote reference works he was citing from could be found in any library, which is absolutely false. Still, even a broken clock is right twice a day. Then you have Darth Vader, who I claimed was actually Jesus Christ. Among the many parallels between the life of Darth Vader and Jesus were, he was immaculately conceived, storms a temple, declared the chosen one, and then rejected, becomes the leader of a large army, among many more. I also spoke about Chewbacca, actually being Al Jassassa, who is a hairy beast that, according to Islam, is friends with the Antichrist. Further, I accused Han Solo of being that Antichrist. No time to explain. And now, we can add Jedi to the pile. The book The Return of the Serpents of Wisdom, just like George Lucas, also claims that Jesus Christ was a Jedi. But don't listen to me. Here's George Lucas telling you where he gets his stories from. I notice in The Phantom Menace, the new episode one, that uh, they discover this slave child who has a an aura about him. And it reminded me of uh, how the Buddhists go out to look for the next Dalai Lama. Mm -hmm. Well, there's, a, again, a mixture of all kinds of, of uh, mythology and religious beliefs that have been amalgamated into the movie. I didn't want to invent a religion. I wanted to try to explain in a different way the religions that have already existed. You're creating a new myth. Well, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm telling an old myth in a new way. I'm telling an old myth in a new way. I'm telling an old myth in a new way. I'm telling an old myth in a new way. There are three main types of spirits. Angels, demons, and elementals. Angels, like demons and elementals, can be conjured, invoked, and communicated with. Angels are mostly benevolent and are sometimes unwilling to execute evil commands because they, like all spirits, prefer doing tasks that are similar to their personality. Most, but not all, demons are spirits trapped in a bottomless pit while other demons are free roaming and take pleasure in being sent off to do evil. Elementals are spirits who are neither exclusively bad or exclusively good and roam the earth freely. They too can be conjured and instructed to complete certain tasks. Almost all spirits, with maybe the exception of elementals, exist in a strict hierarchy. One must also be careful to never assign a spirit to do what is outside of their power or intellect. Spirits, like us, also have gender. Spirits view the earth as a three-dimensional living environment. Multitudes of spirits live in the sky, the ocean, underground, and even among us in our own homes. Most spirits insist on living in deserted places where no humans walk. Regardless of their type, spirits, like humans, have their own personality. Some are pleasant, while others are forever hostile to each other and mankind. Even spirits with extremely low intelligence may be capable of remembering all that they have ever seen in their hundreds, if not thousands of years. The demons have been placed in servitude, and the chains of this servitude are the very symbols and procedures that we call magic. The symbols and procedures are complicated, and they have to be. Every day, people mindlessly doodle symbols while chatting on the phone or sitting in class. Every day, words are rearranged in endless combinations forming sentences never said before. Luckily, and quite deliberately, the conjuring of a spirit or the casting of a spell has been placed far beyond the realms of the accidental. The arbitrary nature of magic's proceedings is to ensure that it was an act of free will, and nothing less. Each demon has a specific symbol associated with it, and further, there are some symbols that can injure a demon, and other symbols and charms that demons can sense nearby even if they are concealed. All magic books have a section on banishments of spirits, or what is often called the license to depart.
The word demon has been a bit overused throughout the years. Demon is a blanket term we have given all malevolent, intelligent beings regardless of their form. When a spirit inhabits and possesses a person, we call it a demon. When we witness a ghastly creature with red, glowing eyes, for instance, we call it a demon. But demons come in shades of gray, some more material than others. Sometimes demons are often described as soul travelers, spoke of as if their motionless material body lies idle in some far distant place while their astral projection roams free among us, causing illness, strife, and feeding off the life force that humans emit when experiencing intense emotions like fear, lust, and anger. These very same emotions also open a portal to the mind where the demon's whispering can become even more influential. Being in a dream state or intoxicated may also help to open this mind gate. Some demons can only feed on anger and consequently will incite fights and cause bad dreams to induce fear. Other demons feed off of lust and will whisper lustful thoughts and even descend upon sleeping victims to cause wet dreams. Sometimes, when babies cry endlessly for no reason, they are being tormented by a demon. And even cats, who magicians have long used as spirit detectors, can sense beings the human eye cannot. Demons, like all creatures, prefer doing deeds that are agreeable to their personality. So naturally, the demons delight in being sent off to do dirty jobs. Vague commands leave room for a demon's natural mischief, so your orders must be specific. Your commands must include intent with a limited target and time frame. Demons exist within a strict hierarchy, and often, when you assign one demon to do a certain task, he may in fact hand that assignment to one of his subordinates. Many Christians and Muslims believe that there are only three main characters who play a part in the end times, Satan, Christ, and the Antichrist. But the truth is that there are much more entities involved here. Even though Satanists use terminology from almost all known religions, the names of the highest ranking demons are for the most part universal. Names like Satan, Moloch, Lucifer, Baal, Belial, Samael, Lilith, Leviathan, Azazel, Tiamat, Set, Ashtaroth, Belzebub, and Asmodeus. Muslims and magicians consider King Solomon of Israel to have been one of the most powerful magicians ever. Solomon was said to have power over all the demons and spirits of the earth. It is said that King Solomon could, through the power of God, force any demon to do anything he wanted. Further, magicians, Muslims, and even apocryphal texts, like the Testament of Solomon, claim that many of the builders of Solomon's temple were in fact demons. The Freemasons have long claimed an association with the builders of Solomon's temple. Just what is masonry, Kipling? Oh, it's an ancient order, dedicated to the brotherhood of man, under the all-seeing eye of God. We should have done well to have left that sort of thing behind us in England, my friend. It could never work here. Oh, there are tales that it did work here, before we ever came. Some audacious scholars can even trace it back to the builders of Solomon's temple. Satanists are followers of what is called the left-hand path. The basic premise of the left-hand path is self-deification, where, using body transformation and magic, the Luciferian seeks to become as God and acknowledges no right and wrong. For the Luciferian, do as thou wilt is the whole of the law, an entire religion founded upon demon worship and the predatory instinct. Luciferians are encouraged to abandon their human traits and the emotional baggage that accompanies it. The Muslims, perhaps out of spite for Satanists, follow the right-hand path to such the extent that they even insist on doing things like eating and dressing with the right hand. Muslims are encouraged to do as much as possible in their daily life using the right hand, while their left hand has been resigned to do the dirty job. They also believe that a person's demon counterpart, which is the opposite of a guardian angel, always resides invisibly on that person's left side. Modern Luciferians, like Michael W. Ford, author of Luciferian Sorcery, are also familiar with the Jedi, but they refer to the Jedi as vampires. Vampires are converted humans who, after the correct ritual, become a new kind of being with extrasensory perception and a need to feed off of human life force. While sleeping, the astral body of a vampire parts with his physical body, allowing him to travel anywhere he chooses. The astral body of these beings roam at night and descend upon sleeping humans, where they steal the sleeping person's life force. 
Vampires do not need to sacrifice animals or people during rituals because they are capable of giving the life force that they have collected from humans instead. What is Luciferian magic and how is it different from traditional magic? Luciferian magic uh, comes from a system that's comprised of several different uh, elements of magic. And magic traditionally means to ascend and to become something different, uh, something better. Uh, Luciferian magic uh, embodies all the elements of the adversary to sort of transform the self into that spiritual uh, semblance. Transform the self, transform the self, transform the self, transform the self. The chamber where one intends on doing a ritual should be clean. The ritual chamber should be as dark and far away from other people as possible, and ideally at night. If the ritual site is indoors, there should be no hanging things above you. This way, if the spirit arrives bringing wind, objects will not be falling upon those present. Every kind of spirit has a specific method of calling and this calling must be done at the right time and in the right way. Often, a circle is drawn on the ground and symbols are placed around this circle. These symbols, usually composed of five and six pointed stars, are placed around the circle relative to the points of the compass, so that some symbols are placed on the east side of the circle, some on the west, and so on. What's more, even certain incantations must be said while facing in certain directions. An altar is usually placed at the center of the circle, and it is this altar where the spirit will make his appearance. Often, the magician will stand inside of the circle, conjuring on the outside. The circle, together with the symbols drawn around it, keep the spirit bound in that region and serves to protect the magician. The magician may also have symbols and charms located on their body as further protection. One of the most common symbols used is the pentacle. When the spirit arrives, the atmosphere of the chamber will change. The ritual site, whether indoors or outside, may become windy, the chamber may become noisy, and an overpowering stench may accompany this wind and noise. Other indications that the spirit is present include ringing of ears, tingling of fingertips and face, a misty fog that fills the room, and of course standard poltergeist activity. Then the spirit should be commanded to speak softly and in the native tongue of the magician. Some spirits have a voice that is hoarse and unsoothing while others speak in a naturally pleasant tone. Spirits appear in many forms, and the same spirit may even appear in different forms. The magician should ask the spirit to take on a form that is not repulsive because many spirits arrive as hideous beasts. Group magic is always stronger than spells cast by a single magician, so the more, the better. Mysteriously, spirits are easier to see with the aid of a mirror. An arriving spirit may appear in a mirror first, and then become visible directly. Communicating with spirits using a mirror is called scrying. After the spirit has heard your commands, you must give him license to depart. Magicians always end a summoning or evocation with banishments. Even black magicians, who speak to demons with the highest respect, have intense fear of those who they have summoned. Jack Parsons, for instance, the famous rocket engineer and black magician, failed to completely banish the spirits he called upon. His failing to completely close the gate led to poltergeist activity, where he and other members of his coven were attacked and harassed. The spirits hurled projectiles at Jack and his friends, and even managed to start a fire. Jack Parsons, who renamed himself the Antichrist, even conjured an entity who identified herself as the Whore of Babylon. This spirit told Parsons that she would one day manifest herself in flesh during the end times. Jack described Babylon as a redhead of incredible beauty and intellect. In other texts of black magic, the scarlet woman that Parsons spoke of is called Lilith. He also claimed that at the age of 13, he conjured Satan into visible form, where he sent his astral body into the abyss and returned to Earth, renaming himself the Antichrist. This trip into the abyss, which Jack Parsons called the Black Pilgrimage, may simply be another name for body transformation. Magic offers many abilities that do not require permanent body transformation. Magic can cause stormy weather, terrible winds, 
lightning, and even earthquakes. With the correct spells, one may render themselves invisible and even fly. There are spells that can provide nearly instant transport for the magician's physical body to exceedingly remote places. The magician can inquire spirits about the location of hidden things, people, and even treasure. The magician may also consult spirits regarding events in the distant past, near future, and even in distant places. Aging is simply a series of small injuries that don't heal to 100%, but using witchcraft, injuries of the larger sort may be corrected. This kind of magic offers its user yet another effective method for life extension. Some spells allow the magician to shapeshift, making him appear as anything from an animal to a small child, or as stated earlier, completely invisible. Spirits can be assigned duties that involve causing strife and discord among lovers and even poor organizations. Also, many spirits are extremely talented in the sciences and liberal arts, and can aid the magician in these types of endeavors. They can make him a good poet, speaker, singer, musician, and in perhaps in Jack Parsons' case, a brilliant scientist. Hollywood Insider's Illuminati Esoterra is, for the most part, a sequel to Magic in the Matrix, with further supporting info to be found in Hollywood Insider's Dark Stars and Full Disclosure. Well friends, I hope you found this video eye-opening. I also hope you have the wisdom to realize just how serious its message really is. And now that I've taught you some of what I know, it's your turn to teach others what you know. Take care, and thanks for watching.